you know, I don't like controversial stuff just for controversy's sake. Uh, but this may be a bit uh, uncomfortable only and mainly to the people that it's going to be applicable to. Um, uh, Minister Davis, hey, hey, hey. So I'm warning you now, uh, this may be a little rich. I am Pagani. Good to see you, man of God. Um, so I've been resting today, uh, chilling. I spent the earlier parts of the day with my babies. Uh, this is their first day of spring break. And so I was doing daddy duty earlier and then... Uh, I've just been laying around, to be very frank, uh, handling a lot of administrative things and uh, just relaxing, taking an off day. And so I, um, the Lord spoke something to me at the beginning of the year um, that I had shared uh, at Fire Conference. And, um, but I'm, I'm starting to, I got a couple of phone calls today about a similar subject and I want to share it with you because here's the deal. I want to save somebody's family from burnout, from breakdown. Somebody just said, I hold on our wigs. Probably, probably. And I want to save the some people from some abuse of grace and money and resource and time and energy. What I'm going to be talking about today is called a kingdom merger. A kingdom merger. Okay? I'm talking about a kingdom merger. And the subtitle of this is going to be how to know you were never called to start a church. The subtitle to that is going to please is going to be please sir ma'am don't start a church. And it's going to be the difference between a specialist and a founder, okay? So I'm going to hit something really quickly uh and let you know. Now Let's start with this. It is all wrong. It is all bad. It is extremely religious to believe that because you are a preacher and because you've been called by God to ministry, that you've got the educational and from a kingdom standpoint, that you've got the spiritual and that you've got the emotional intelligence to build the church. And um, this stuff is, is, is common sense to me. And other people are considering it genius. Uh, because I guess nobody in the inner city context ever talks about it. But I'm going to start with this premise. And then I'll give you scripture to support it. There are a couple of streets in my city. Halsted. Uh, Racine, Damon, Chicago Avenue, et cetera, et cetera, um, that are flooded with churches. I mean, infested with churches. And I mean, like next door to each other. And I don't mean in a neighborly sense. I mean, in an almost invasive sense where they are only separated by maybe a couple of inches of drywall. And um, ironically enough, these houses are, um, how do we say, I, I, the feeble is the best, best word for them, but the more appropriate thing to help you see about them is that they are always in the worst neighborhoods um, in the city. So you got, you know, in my city, I'm, I'm not talking about yours yet, but in my city, those are the worst areas, the worst communities, the ghettos, the slums, those that have not experienced regentrification. And, um, you know, so before I started, I, in ministry and stuff, I thought it was just weird or, you know, unusual, but as I, when I started my ministry and after we began growing, it, it hit me one day, almost like an um, epiphany. Why don't many people talk about merging? I don't understand. Like if you got seven people and I got four people and we've been going for a combined total of 32 years and we share the same building and I still have a job to pay for the bills of the church. I don't ever think, I, to me, 
and this is not the prophetic or anything. I, I just don't understand why people don't merge. And I think that it goes back to the fundamental reasons of why you started or wanted to start a ministry to begin with. I just went away with like 60 to 70 of the pastors I oversee, and we had a great retreat time. And one of the things that I told them was that, um, hey, I'm going to deal with you and teach you almost as if you don't have a church. So I told all of them, act like you don't have a church right now. And I'm going to tell you what your pastor should have told you before you got started. So we went for a, uh, a, a series of three. Hey, who is this right here? Underscore the Haven. Don't go anywhere because I actually want to hear that story. We went for a series of three to four days talking about things that, that, that you should have learned, that you should have considered, that you should have evaluated before you drug your body and your family and your finances into this indefinite assignment with no real measurable way to know whether or not you were supposed to do it or not. And, um, and so I've had a lot of discussions about this over the years and everybody, some people get offended with it, other people agree and don't realize that it's actually applicable to them. But I believe that as the tides turn in America, we need to start some serious discussions about mergers. If we're going to be impactful, and I'm not talking about just on an individual level, I'm talking about on a city level, we probably need to start doing what's effective for our, uh, for our reach into the city. Now, if your objective, I've got grace, I've got pastoral grace, I've got ministry grace on me, and um, I need to touch lives, you know, you don't have to start a church to touch that. Matter of fact, touching lives is probably the wrong reason to start a church. You can touch lives at an altar call. You can touch lives on a job. You can touch lives on a bus stop. You can touch lives on an Uber. You probably don't need to start a whole church to create a context for your gifting if that's all you imagine yourself doing is being like little old Noah who is saving the, you know, the, the, the small group of people from the flood. Um, a couple of years ago, I had somebody tell me when I was dealing with this issue and I was talking about fruitfulness and I was talking about measuring the health of local churches and somebody said, well, did not Noah go back to save some in the flood? I said, he absolutely did, but Noah didn't build a church. He built a boat. And if I had a yacht, I wouldn't, I'm not trying to touch the city and I'm not trying to save the nation. What I'm trying to do is escape the water. So I told her, let Noah stick to the boat building and let the apostles build the church. And it's that mentality that's got you broke, unhealthy, dysfunctional, and it's actually an abuse of your real gifting. See, my concern with these churches that are being springing up and even those that are already in existence is that sometimes the, the head of the house really has legitimate grace. They have a legitimate fivefold calling, but I'm going to tell you that there are some intricate things that we need to discuss. Number one, just because you were called to be a pastor does not mean that you are a good leader. If you have a fivefold ministry gift call and Jesus the shepherd is alive in your life, that does not necessarily mean that you're going to do good with being a leader. If you're going to build a New Testament church, you've got to build it with the model of Jesus Christ. Now, this is all just pr primary, and I haven't even really got to the meat of this. I just want you to consider how criminal it is for every preacher to start their preaching career with the idea that I just need to preach for enough years until I get the other call. Because you get the first call, and that's to preach. And then the next call is you start the church. And if you take that last call from them, then they don't have a real context. So they're like, well, if I'm a preacher and I, I shouldn't start a church, then what do I do with my gift? You be a part of another church that's strong enough, large enough, and broad enough to uphold your gifts, support it, and create context for the content that you have. Now, somewhere, 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 we started designing a concept of church birth and church planting um, estranged from and foreign to the way that, the, that Jesus did it. 
So what I'm telling you is not just a personal success story, because if you ask me, we got a long ways to go. But um, what did Jesus do? It was always his intentions. If you study Ephesians 1, the church is the masterpiece of God. Okay, it fills heaven and it fills earth is what the Bible says. And the scriptures talk about it as the body of Christ. It's supposed to fill all and all, right? So if the church was always the plan of God and the church was the idea of God to begin with, then it means that when he came to earth as the Messiah, he did have the church in mind. And he had the church in mind, though the kingdom of heaven is broader than the church. The church is the instrument by which it is born, by which it comes. And um, so if you consider what Jesus did in his model and his method of starting a church, Jesus did not take the preach until you can't preach no more model of church leadership. In other words, he didn't say preach, 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 preach. And then the apex or the zenith or the high point of my preaching career is going to be this decision, this epiphany, this idea to create a church so I can have a place to preach every Sunday. That wasn't what he did. Who out there knows what Jesus did when he wanted to build the church? I'll tell you. I ain't got time to wait. Jesus built a team. He built a team. He created a team. He had grace to attract a team. The mantle on him was strong enough to attract people that were literally willing to lay their lives down to form a team. So sign number one, you probably should not be pastoring in that sense or attempting to raise money to start a church or keeping a church alive after 20 years with 12 people is that you don't know how to build a team. That's how you know you're not a leader. You can have a shepherd's rod and a shepherd's staff and a pastoral gift and a pastoral anointing and a pastoral call and it don't mean that you are a leader. And here is the doozy. If we're going to get extremely technical and extremely biblical and extremely, dare I say, apostolic and extremely New Testament, Jesus never made somebody with a pastoral only calling build the church. Because of the nature of the pastor, you are coded to need to be attached to, to be synthesized with the needs of people. So because you're so attached to the needs, the wars, the challenges, the changes of people, you don't always make good decisions as a leader. The worst leaders are those that are moved all the time by people. That's what went wrong with Saul. If you go to the book of Acts and you go through chapters 1 through 5, 5 through 12, 12 through chapters 28, you won't find a pastor there because the work of founding was not pastoring. The work of building was not pastoring. Pastoring had to do with maintaining, with stabilizing, with nurturing, and with caring for. But if nothing is started, if nothing is constructed, if nothing is confronted, then you don't have anything to stabilize and you don't have anything to nurture. You don't have anything to blow into. A true pastor in every sense of the word in the Bible probably is not going to have the ability to gather either. <laughs> They're probably not going to be gatherers. Why? Why? Because that, that shepherd's mentality only, that pastoral spirit only, they leave the masses to go to the one. They're not interested in gathering. They're interested in going after the strays, nurturing, caring, supplying, maintaining. So we need them. We, we need a lot of them. I'm crazy, you crazy, because we probably have not been appropriately pastored in our past. That's fine. Grace is sufficient. God will supply you later in life. But we need them. They just probably shouldn't be the ones trying to pressure themselves to start churches because you can be a great pastor and a horrible leader. Jesus' church planting strategy was simple. 
build a team and let a team build the church. I'm going to give you that biblical model again. Build a team and let the team build a church. Our idea is we get a pastor and that pastor, pastor builds a church. But Jesus' model was create a team and the team builds the church. Jesus built a team, trained a team after three years. And then when he was done with the team, he met with them and he said, hey, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then he had the unmitigated gall to die. <laughs> so who built the church? His team. Our color people kill pastors. We kill them. We give them strokes. We ruin their marriages. We rob their kids of quality families because we expect them to be the ones building the whole church. No, 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 no. You've got the thuggish, ruggish Babylonian deacons that come together with this business plan and they create this pastoral position that they can puppet around and they find some dude with suspenders on who just wants the opportunity to preach every Sunday and uh, they hire him and they tell him what to do. But nowhere in the Bible does the, does the scriptures give authority to a deacon. Nowhere, nowhere should you be in a church that's deacon controlled. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and God has said in the church, first apostles. Them deacons came much later in the game because the apostles wanted to pray and spend time in the word, right? And they needed somebody to handle the daily ministrations and the needs of people, correct? So if the origin of the diaconate was that they needed to be serving people and they needed to be dealing with the administrative and the other ministerial functions of the apostles, then what the heck made them be the business managers and the governmental contract design and offering counting communion serving uh, uh, CEOs of the church. No wonder we don't have apostolic power. We don't have apostolic patterns. We didn't let these deacons come up and fire pastors and kill pastors. No, no. See, the, the, the whole concept is so anti-biblical, it's crazy. When a person has been called by God to open the context for a local church, there's going to be grace on that person to gather a team. That team is going to come from different walks of life. Jesus chose 12 men that had business acumen. The way we start churches is we look around. Pookie, Ray Ray, Melanie, Shay Shay. Then you used to sing in the sunshine. Okay, come on. All right, where did Tambrin go? All right, we're going to start Bible studies. Boom. And we do it for like a month and then a year and then two years and then five years. And then we have anniversaries, church and pastor anniversaries. And we celebrate our cyclical failure. No soul saved, no lives changed, no city impact, no owning property. We're just having anniversaries because we've weathered the storm and we've actually lasted. Then listen, I'm not trying to be too deep, but I believe God has probably grieved with a lot of them anniversaries because you're successful or you're celebrating something he never authorized and that he never called you to do. So you got, you know, you got your little ads in the paper and you got to, you know, the people, you know, the, the little funeral homes celebrating stuff. And you're like, uh, uh, we're here. A 50-year church and pastor anniversary. And nobody's ever asked the question. 
Should we be celebrating and we're still in debt or celebrating and we don't have any new converts or celebrating and we've never given birth to another church willingly? Every church that's ever been born from this church had to be forced out of the womb because we were too impotent and sterile to create or to plant a church. So we're really not a life field organization because we don't carry the capacity to plant other churches. Every other leader in the midst of us that's being groomed to start a church has got to tear themselves from us because we make them feel like they're a traitor for being called by God. <clears throat> All of those issues prove that the dude that started it is probably a pastor, but he's not a founder. I know probably 20 people right now that's itching to start a church. I mean, they like, can't wait, can't wait. You know, you bring them to conferences, you expose them to ministry, you take a... And they're building this brand in their head about what it's going to be like when they get into town. I also know people that's tormented because they ain't started yet and don't know what the heck they doing when they get there. So we got to start having some hard conversations. Just because you are called to pastor does not mean you're called to lead. Most pastors are influencers. Whew but they're not really all that great of a leader. <laughs> when Jesus created his staff, he called them apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. He came up with some administrative roles to support the supernatural role, bishops, deacons, and elders. So there are leadership dynamics to any anointing that's grace to open, craft, and found a work. But let me ask you a question. Between Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, who was the leader? Moses. And aside from, apart from the context of Moses, this is going to get nasty in a minute, Miriam probably wouldn't have been as significant. Aaron wouldn't have been as significant. It took for an anointing that was capacitated to do a lot larger things to create context for the grace that was on Miriam and the grace that was on Aaron. They wouldn't have been successful trying to single-handedly lead the Israelites because they didn't have the same type of grace. Not, it's not about value. It's not about importance. It's not about significance. It is simply a matter of grace. And many of you all out there right now are selling Snickers, and selling peanuts and begging people to come and join your church and, 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 and recruiting disgruntled members from other folk church because the hard gospel truth is you ain't got the grace. You are anointed for something, but you don't have grace to build and to found. And ap apparently, God has not deposited the attractive mechanism in your mantle to build the staff. Because God assigns a team to a leader and a leader to a team. And if after 20 years you ain't got the team, it's because you're not the leader. So, our dynamic is that we've got a bunch of Miriams and we got a bunch of Aaron's looking at Moses saying, Hey, I can do that too. You, I, could, I could prophesy too. I could... I could open me a church too. I don't have to be in your shadow, dummy. What happens is when you come apart from the grace, the leader graced for your particular ministry and you detach and you try to do it on your own, it's not going to be but six months before you feel the pain of trying to branch out to do what you were not graced to do. Why? Because the anointing may draw people, but leadership is going to keep them. So sure, they'll come and listen to you sing. Sure, they'll come and get a word from you. Sure, they'll support an event. But nobody in their right mind is going to submit their lives to you when it is apparent that you're not really a leader. You are an influencer. Your grace is suggestive. The thing that is on your life has the ability to help me with my decision making, but I would never look to you to explain my explanation. Explorations of destiny. Slow down, Stevenson. 
So, yeah, that's a problem. I know leaders um, that when they were connected to, I was thinking about my father and the Lord and certain leaders that used to be connected to him and how when they detached for whatever reason and tried to do it on their own, they were frail, non-accomplished, no success. And, and that's in whatever version of success you're going to say. I mean, just zilch success. And I couldn't help but think, you know, Certain anointings just work better by certain graces. Don't get mad at Moses. Get mad at God. He's the one that didn't give you what you needed to do it. That's the first thing. Here's another thing. AD, Pastor Adrian Davis, you in here. This is about to bless you. When I, my church will be 12 this year, probably around year three and year four, I started going with the trend of, I don't want no church transfers. Give me some new souls. I want the people from the streets. I want the streets. You know, it was deep. A lot of people, this is going, now here's where people get offended with me. They probably going to call my father in the Lord right now to tell me to shut up. That's what they do. They call him. Would you shut him up? So, so I'm about to offend some people right now. But I was with that. That was, that was the thing to say. That was the thing to do. It was mature. It seemed righteous. It seemed ethical. Hold another periscope. It seemed integral to be like, God just really wants the laws. But then I started thinking, whoa, what is this prevailing doctrinal error that suggests that God is more interested in and more invested in and more committed to the loss than he is the found who think they found? Or is God more committed to, invested in, interested in the loss than he is the overchurched? Those that have been in church all their lives so much that it's toxic. And now they've been so brainwashed by the model that they've been in that they have no real clear concept of the kingdom. So I, um, there were things that we were doing from the beginning that we didn't know why we were doing it. We were just doing it as led by the Holy Ghost. And um, I used to cringe when people would come to me from other places, you know. Uh, it used to make me feel bad, you know. I've never really been a real relatable person with other pastors. So, And, and I do have pastor friends now. But I'm, then I didn't talk to nobody. and so, But it still made me feel a little weird about them coming. But then... Um, the Lord dealt with me about it, and then he sent a prophet to confirm his dealings with me. And here's what the Lord said. The Lord dealt with me and said, if I send people to you, you don't send them back to Pharaoh, even if they are a pastor. If I'm sending people to you, give me some water, woman. You don't, with ice, you don't send them back to Pharaoh. If I am what's behind releasing people out of this place to you, then don't you send them back to bondage. So I said, okay, yes, Lord, I understand. Let me prove it by the Bible. Morris, you know I'm coming for you, right? You belong to me, though, so I got your back. Let me ask all y'all a question. Where did John the Baptist get his church from? Answer me. Answer me. Answer me. Answer me. Where did John the Baptist get his church from? Bam. They came out of the wilderness into the synagogue to his leadership, which means they were transfers. Part number two. Where did Jesus get his church from? I'm about to wear you out. I'm just in a mood. Where did Jesus get his church from? Come on. Where did Jesus get his church from? John the Baptist. I can prove it. See, I'm not with this whole bro code among preachers. Jesus got his church from John the Baptist. And you know how? John the Baptist realize that it is important to merge when the moment comes. The moment came. So when the moment came, 
Jesus perceived not the person of Jesus, not the graphics of Jesus, not the swag of Jesus, not the armor, but Jesus perceived, um, Jesus, John perceived what rested on Jesus and he said, I must decrease. What was he talking about? What was he talking about? When he said, I must decrease, was he talking about I'm not as important? Did he mean that God don't love me as much? Did he mean that I am no longer significant? No. What he said was, there is grace on Jesus that is not on me. Now, I know they don't want you to hear that, but I'm, I'm blowing the whistle. There is grace on Jesus that is not on me. So because I was able to handle these disciples up to this point, I'm going to step back and let you increase because you've got grace to lead and I've got grace to preach. John the Baptist grace was a preaching prophetic revival grace. It was not a building, constructing, contextual, fathering grace. So, if people come to me, that's between them and that pastor. Them and that pastor. I don't get involved. Well, let me just say this, if, if, if you know, because you're probably watching anyway. I know you're going to talk about it. I don't even know, to be honest, where many of the people that join my church come from. I have no clue. I have not personally taken in a member in like 11 years. I don't go downstairs. I don't review their paperwork. So no, I'm not sending you no letter. And frankly, I don't care if you sent one because I don't have the time. I'm not sitting up in my office on Monday morning reviewing the Rolodex to see who left what church disgruntled. That's not my business. That's between you and that person. But here is perspective. Brethren, sisterin, perspective is, do you really want somebody to stay with you? Who don't want to be with you? I mean, how dumb and how rejected are you to get flustered and frustrated that you go running into somebody's up church after a member decides to leave? Oh, no, you don't. Come on back here. You ain't going to let them people go. Listen, Matthew Stevenson III could give a nickel's worth of dog meat if somebody feels led to go to somebody else's church. I don't care. I bless them. Absolutely. You have my blessing. You have my support. I wish you well in everything you do. I don't own you. I don't own you. So, you know, pastors get mad because I guess the people leave like I'm personally trick or treating at these temples of tolerance going around recruiting people. And I don't I don't even really go to church events. I can't stand them. I've been so immersed in 6028 uh, South Champlain that I forget what church culture is like in my city. But I'm going to tell you the problem with all of this is that we don't understand kingdom mergers and merging. Now, these are a, a couple of different combined scenarios that I'm talking about. The first scenario that I'm talking about is this. You may be anointed in a, for a para or a specialist situation, which means that you have an anointing. You are a specialist. You have a grace you have a message, but you're not a general practitioner. There is nothing on you that should be trying to speak to, treat, and build something for the entire human experience. You have a word, an anointing, a burden that springs up around some time. Don't start a church. Because even if you start a church, when we start coming, we're going to feel your specialty anyway. Because you're only going to talk about the same thing. And even if you try to talk about other things, you're only anointed at one thing. If you are an intercessor and that, that's everything you do, that's the only thing you're going to talk about. Good. But what I'm going to do about addiction, about porn, about dysfunction, what I'm going to do. If all you got to do is tell me to pray and I could have went to the Bible for that. I don't come to a house to hear repeat messages for the rest of my life, which is why John was going to be ineffective in the era of the church because he had one message. Repent, the kingdom is at hand. Jesus' message was broad. So, don't start a church. But here is the challenge of parachurches. Here we go. 
Here's where the inboxes come. Here's where the emails. See, this is why I don't answer stuff. Cause folk get mad. Drinky all of it. That's right. Here's the here's the problem. Here's the other problem. When you have a parachurch ministry, let me say this. I believe in them. I support them. I have become a donor to some. I have written checks to others. But the lifespan, the relevance of a parachurch ministry is based upon the ineffectiveness of a church somewhere. I'm going to say that again. The lifespan, the... The, the funding, the relevance, the significance of a parachurch. You have to not have something available in a church for you to be important. And that's the truth. A lot of churches need people kind of like paracletes to come alongside them and teach them prayer, teach them the prophetic, teach them business, teach them family, teach them whatever you're going to teach them, right? That's a specialist, but it don't make you a founder, right? So here's a deal. The lifespan of a parachurch is going to die if a church in their area becomes healthy. Because the only reason you have a specialty is because a church has a deficiency. And when the church becomes broad enough and big enough and expanded enough to treat and to speak to the issues that you speak to, then nobody's going to need you. Nobody's going to follow you. And the success of your ministry is going to be events. And so if your ministry is event-based, you don't have a ministry. What you have is a... a uh, Event planning team. So that's important for you to realize. So I just wanted to save some sons out there, some daughters out there. Maybe you are an apostle. Uh, maybe you are a prophet. Maybe you are an evangelist. Please, if you're not certain that God has called you to start a church, or if you are certain that God has called you to start a church, Try it by somebody or run it by somebody that you trust. I know you can't run it past Saul's because they'll convince you out of it, you know. But listen, dude, many of you will probably be incarcerating the anointing on your life by imprisoning it to a pulpit every day. What happens when pastors get mad, you visit other churches. They're controlling and they operate in witchcraft. Boy, they walk. Ah! Woo! <laughs> yeah. Um, so, don't do it. Merge. Now, I believe I'm, it's 762 people in here. I believe I'm talking to at least 12 of y'all. I'm sorry, AD. I passed the AD. I let my hood out. Let me go back to intelligent urban intellectual. There's about um, 20 of you. Um, that are out there and you're pastoring and you're frustrated. You're frustrated. You can't buy your kids new clothes. You barely know how to read. You don't know what's next. You wasted thousands of dollars. You're in debt. Um, and all you want to do is touch lives. Okay. Go and find a broader context for you to touch lives. Don't force yourself to start a church. I beg you, don't do it. We have had four pastors come to us and come to me. I just had one recently, maybe about a couple of weeks ago, and just say, who am I fooling? And we've done it successfully. They've just said, look, we thought we knew what we were doing. And we thought we were supposed to pastor, mm, oops, and they merged in, literally, four, four, and came in and acted like nothing ever happened. The pastors started realizing they were not capacitated to handle the needs of the people. So if you want to just touch people, fine, be, a, be an associate pastor, be a teaching pastor, be a elder in a house, but don't just sit there after 50 years acting like this is your lot in life and the Lord has punished you to these same people. It's not God. 
So some of you out there, you were legitimately called to lead. You were legitimately called to build a church, but you have taken it the highest it can go. See, you got to have people around you that love you enough to tell you when you become obsolete. Now I'm meddling. So the problem is not that you weren't supposed to starve, and the problem is not that you're not fruitful. The problem is you killing your church, and your church is killing you because you stopped being the dude for the job 10 years ago. You, sir, need to retire. And, and pick up a successor and go and rebrand and recreate yourself so don't you don't so you don't continue killing your organization because you ain't got the language of the future for it. And you may have to have the hard talk with yourself and realize maybe I'm not the one to take this over into Jordan. But then we got to have some honest discussions about 401ks and financial responsibility and funding children and funding criminal acts around the city and making sure I got enough income coming in to pay people for hush money around the world. And that's probably why you won't retire. So yeah, I know some dudes that were legitimately called to do it and we're doing it well. And the season changed and they didn't change with the season. And now they're killing the organization and the organization and the intercessors are all wore out. They got PTSD trying to pray for revival when the issue is not that your church needs revival. Your church needs a new leader. Plus, yeah, you don't need revival. It's not about the outpouring of the spirit. It's not about Holy Ghost. Come bring it on back. No, it's about get rid of that dude, please. I mean, polar intercessors. You, I mean, mother got a stroke. I have clothes. She's so sick of fasting. You can see her rib cages. And they believe in God for outpouring of the spirit. And heaven is like, no, no, I'm not pouring out on Moses what should be upon Joshua. No. So maybe you were called to start it and your time is done. Get out the way. Let somebody else do it. Now, or maybe you are an itinerant, you a preacher, you an apostle, you know, you're a prophetess, a prophet, you an evangelist, and you like, I want to, you know, I got to build a ministry because I don't see how else I can have a context. Find you a house that's got mega grace on it. And if a house has mega grace on it, that house is not going to be intimidated of your gifting. What he's going, what that house is going to do is find the context. Listen, if you've got 10,000 people in the house, you literally do have room for at least a thousand pastors. Now, I know I'm talking way out there. This is beyond what you know, that you don't really see it. But just because you don't really see it don't mean it's not right. If you got a mega house with mega grace, strongly New Testament, I mean, there's a lot of them out with. Gateway Church is doing a great job with this. You got thousands of people. You need to have thousands of pastors to be probably one for every 15 to 20 people to make sure that the needs of those people can be adequately imagined. We got a place for you. Don't put your grace in prison by forcing yourself to start a church to fund something God never called you to. I know some brothers right now that's just sad. I mean depressed. Watch everything I do and just mad kicking himself. Talking about it just should have been me. Should have been me. I can do it. And then they get some other little rejects and retards around them. That's rebellious and give him words and say, you don't have to follow up behind him. Get out out of his shadow. And it's all a waste of grace everywhere. Just a waste of grace. Your grace is wasted. Your grace is wasted. Your grace is wasted. Your grace is wasted. If you are a teacher, if you are a prophet, if you are an evangelist, find the right place for your grace. Just because you anointed to preach don't mean that you anointed to, to handle legal disputes, to counsel, to maintain budgets, to facilitate teams, to evaluate properties, to deal with music issues, to deal with marriage issues, to deal with youth issues, to deal with school issues, to deal with children's issues, to deal with city issues, to deal with political management, to deal with red tape, to deal with permits, to deal with fundraising. Preaching is not enough. You can't... Bruh, you can't write a paper 
How you gonna know what to do when, when the city starts fighting you about advancing a movement that they are afraid could become tumultuous to their campaigns? You're not gonna respond. Most of you are not a threat to your city is because you're not a leader. You're not a threat to anything. You're, you, what you do is you preach to people and that don't make you a pastor or an apostle or bishop or something that should be founding something. Bam. So let me minister to a couple of you. Number one, I want to talk to those of you that should be merging. There's a lot of you out there that need to be a good steward over what God has called you to do and shut that thing down. Now, I know this video going to go viral. A lot of people going to be mad at it. You may have some um, uh, conference calls or some me. I could, I, I don't care. Some of you need to shut down. You don't have members, you don't have money, you don't have property, and don't go back talking about where two or three gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst, because that's not applicable to churches, honey. That's about prayer meetings. And if you're trying to hold a prayer meeting, all you need is two or three. But if you're trying to change a city, you need a little more than two or three. Two or three ain't even registered to vote. So you can't change the city with two or three except y'all are wealthy or y'all trying to pray. So let's not do that. You need to merge, merge, get rid of the shame, get rid of the pride, get rid of the ego and find a Moses to be an Aaron to and attach. But what am I going to do with my people? Say oops. Just say oops. We all, <laughs> we all make mistakes. I shouldn't have done this to begin with. I ruined my marriage because of it. I've gotten ulcers because of it. My kids are crazy because of it. Just tell them, oops. And bring them with you. Number one, merge. Shut it down. Be an evangelist. Get under an apostle. Get under a bishop. And let them create a context for you. Become an associate pastor. Become a staff pastor. Just, just, just say, oops. Shut it down. Admit when you were wrong. Number two, I want to talk to those of you that are specialists. We need you right now. There are legitimate local churches that don't have access to certain truths that are active in you. You got a revelation of visitation, a revelation of counseling, a revelation of prayer, a revelation of worship, a revelation of deliverance, a revelation of, prof of the prophetic, a revelation of administration. Let your gift come out of the cage. Don't confine it to a pulpit every Sunday. Go and attach yourself to a house and please don't start a church. Don't do that. You're going to kill yourself, be burnout, and you're going to ruin your gift. Specialist, we need you. Don't do it. Just because you can do it don't mean you should do it. Don't do it. Be a good steward over your gift and join somebody. Number three, you are a legitimate, a legitimate senior leader. And you were legitimately called to start your work. And it's not doing as well as you want it to do. You know God called you to do it. You got some fruit around you. But you don't have access to what you need to teach you to make it grow. Now, if growth is not your concern, there is no way in the world you should be leading nobody. No, I mean, I mean, I wouldn't follow you across the street, much less with, to make you the, the overseer of my soul. No. You need to grow it. And the way you grow it is you become partakers of a, the grace that's on another man or another woman. I believe women can be used apostolically as well. Become a partaker of their grace. The partaker of their grace. And let life flow into you to give you strategies on how to take it to the next level. How do you take this to the next level? How do I reach millennials? How do I buy month, uh, buildings without debt? Do I need to go into a mortgage? Do I need that old school model of, of church where you sign your life over to a bank and let them dictate your vision and so that I don't have money to give into nations and sow into missions or, or reproduce another church? Or I don't know. Listen, I know legitimate leaders whose mandate is suffering because of the quality of their team. There are some 
senior leaders that really got the oil on him, but they just got a weak team. And the problem is uh, the leader's mandate, unfortunately, is going to be at the mercy of the competence of his team. So many of you probably are calling to do, called to do what you're doing. You just have an extremely incompetent team, and it is a reflection of your leadership skill. Good leaders build good teams, and good teams build good churches. That's it. So that's how you got to do it. And that's what you need to do. I am so concerned. I, 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 when, when I start raising up men of God, no matter what age they are, I had this conversation with men, men that I began their ministry careers in their 50s, 40s. It doesn't matter what age you are. And I take them out and I say, hey, do you want to start a church? And then when they start talking, I ask them, okay, well, do you have a heart for this, 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 this? Do you foresee yourself doing that? And many of them have said absolutely under no circumstances. And I tell them, well, don't start a church. What you should do is create a context for ministry, but it does not have to be a house. Don't try to start a house if what you were called to do was have a ministry. It's simple. So, yeah, that's all I've got today. I try to con I try to deal with a lot of preachers, man. People be like, "Can I just pick your brain?" I'm like, "Yeah," and 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 a lot of them are real fivefold gifts. Some of them are even apostles. But y'all let these college of bishops and all these folk tell you that if you are apostolic, you got to plant one church and then go around and plant a whole bunch of thirty churches. And so you got all these old frail preemies going around that can't live on their own and all they do is whine and make a bunch of noise because they're not thorough and they're not lively enough to, to be on their own or to come to the point of birth where they can reproduce. No, the, the, the apostles predate the church. So it is possible for you to be an apostle and not be called to pastor. No, you can legitimately be an apostle and not be called to pastor nobody's church. You can be an evangelistic apostle, a teaching apostle. Somebody said frail is okay. Why in the world would you believe something like that? And, you know, the only people who are offended by this is the people who it's applicable to. Y'all like sitting up. I mean, listen, you know what's funny? I mean, you go to these churches and it's all ran by family and don't nobody go there but family. I think this. Dude, you could stay home and save these bills. Stop paying for these old kinko graphics, hoping that somebody will finally come to you. Just have dinner. Have dinner. The Bible said they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, going from house to house, bro. This week we at Auntie Nisi's house. This week we, <laughs> we at Antoine's house. Next week we at... Just switch houses. Don't start a church. Please, somebody say, I have an assignment, my friend. I bet you ain't got no overseer. And if you do, they probably got the same amount of members as you do. See, people will start fighting this stuff because they think that God don't want growth. You have failed. You can be saved and be a ministry failure. If nobody's coming to you, you don't have a darn assignment, people. Oh, you assemblies of God. No wonder. I, I get it. I understand. I understand. Because the part now, now listen, I come from the assemblies of God, but one of the things I have a problem with is that they don't ask you if God called you to do what you're doing. I know people that recruit you to start churches out of the assembly. They'll come to you and they'll be like, hey, I, I got a guy right now who works for the AG who comes because they need black people right now and they start sweeping through the churches to find out if one of your sons or one of the leaders there can start a church. Now, where in hell is that a legitimate way to start a church is by going to give a survey to people who preach to ask them if they're supposed to call. That's if People like you is why we got it wrong now because your denomination need folk coming to you know, start a church and, and do it. Hey, you want to start a church? You want to start a church? You want to start a church? Come on, you're black. We need ethnic diversity. Come and start. Get that crap out of here, man. If you don't have the resources of heaven, and if you don't have the angels backing you, and if you don't have miracles that uphold your mandate, don't nobody care what denomination plants you. Ugh. It's carnal, guys. It's, it's a matter of grace. I disagree with all this crap. I don't think y'all should be taking multiple choice questions to become evangelists. I don't believe in trial sermons. I don't believe in half this stuff. <laughs> but I love you. And listen, to you bishops, you know, you apostles, you men and women of God, 
What I'm doing is trying to teach you, teach you to protect your grace. And God raises up leaders for every type of people. So I'm not saying they all got to be like me. We don't, the world really don't need a whole lot of that. You know, we need some, but not a whole lot. I'm just saying that you really do need to be in your ministry contacts. People stop starting weak churches. Now my city right now, there's a lot of foolishness going on in it, but in the midst of the foolishness, there was a major arrival of some dynamic churches that are doing a lot of good things in my city. So we got some people that ain't doing nothing and all they doing is, you know, remembering what they used to do because nobody else is listening but but each other. And, um, you know, that's that. And But we do have some real strong ministry going on in Chicago. In Chicago, we got some powerful ministry going on. I know some men of God. I can name you about six to seven leaders in my city alone that are holding down the various streams that they're born from. I mean, Reggie Royal right now, he's he's more of a, he's got a word of faith anointing, but he's an apostle of that. He Anybody that was groomed in word of faith, they'll go to Lifeline and they'll be fed and they'll be healed. They'll be delivered. You got one of my closest friends, John Hanna. He's got probably one of the most profound evangelistic anointings. And and he 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 attracts the dead and the dying, and he's anointed for prayer, and he's got one of the baddest worship revelations that I've ever seen in my life. He's attracting people. You've got Bishop Hudson. Bishop Hudson is 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 a is a is is a a, a, a product of Pentecost. He is single-handedly handling the Renaissance and the rebirth of Pentecost. I got the gifts, you know. You got Smokey Norfolk is doing a great job. So everybody in my city ain't doing bad. Some of us are doing very well, you know. Apostle Greg House, he's doing awesome, you know. Everybody's not outdated. Everybody's not, you know, struggling. And everybody's not filing bankruptcy. Some of us are doing really, really good, you know. And I've been, so I, what I'm saying is, all of us are in our graces. When I meet with a, a Pastor Hannah, when I meet with any of my other people, we don't even really talk about Stuff like who you ever getting that? We we don't do that type of crap. What we do is we talk about life, we talk about family, we talk about vacation, we talk about clothes. We really do. We talk about stuff that men talk about when they're not preaching. We don't talk about dumb preacher stuff. We don't do that. You understand? We all have our graces. We have our graces. And we don't try to dog other people for their graces. They have had people that come to me in my church that like, look, I can't do this no more. I, 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 this is a lot. And what do I do? I send them to a church that's more suited for what they're supposed to do. Maybe you should go over there. Or maybe you should go over here. Or maybe you should go over there. So there are pillars in my city. And, and, and they're beginning to be raised up for the season that is before us. But the real truth is there's a lot of other parasite-like things trying to be born that's not doing nothing. One of the most offensive conversations, and look, I actually I actually like having these conversations with people because I, I consider myself, um, what's the right word I want to use? A direct communicator, right? I have told people before, I'm not convinced you're supposed to start a church. So for that reason, I can't support you. For that reason, no, you can't be in my network. I'm not going to support you in an assignment that's not God. I have legitimately told people that. No, I don't believe you're supposed to have a church. No, I have had people come to my network and say, you are my apostle. And, and, and after looking at them, and they do a whole uh, uh, a process. Some of my presbyters are on here right now. They're like, mm, mm. and I told people, we don't believe you're supposed to have a church. We believe you're more of a specialist. We're, uh, we believe you're more as a more of a teacher. You need to be a part of, of one of these things. But we don't, we don't just take people for numbers' sake. And true story is, half of the very large denominations around the world, if they would be that involved and if they would be that direct about. Their churches, they probably wouldn't be as large if they examined all the leaders of them to find out whether or not that was really their calling to do.
So that's it for today, <laughs> or at least this afternoon. Um, merge. I hope this bless somebody. Be an assistant pastor. Be a um, an associate pastor. Be a something. But please. Don't let these denominations force you to start a church and don't let um, your the fact that you are an anointed preacher force you. I mean, some people are just very anointed and itinerant, but you should not drag your family through the starting of a church. Merge or retire <laughs> or Stop being jealous of people you should actually learn from. That's what you should do. Don't look up and, what you got going on over there? You stealing all these people. Just stupidity. What you should do is schedule a lunch date, schedule a coffee date, and say, teach me what should be done to be successful in what I do. Don't get mad and be angry and be upset. Learn. That's what I do. If I find that somebody has a grace or a strength that's bigger than or, or that's different from what I'm doing or that they they excel at me in certain areas, I ask questions. Hey, I want to pick your brain. What do you think about this? One of my greatest friends, Jermon Glenn, he's a creative genius. And I've, I've grown in creative creativity. I wasn't always a creative person. Um, I was, I just wanted to prophesy and I just wanted to cast out devils and raise people up. I didn't really care about staging. This is, I know you can't believe that now because now I'm extremely invested in that stuff. But that was the, the byproduct of relationships that I have because I watched what they were doing and I started to learn. So I started going, what do you think about this, bro? Should I uh, add this or how should I approach that? So it, it's, it's not a, 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 a competitive thing. If somebody is better than me at an area that I think that is going to benefit what I'm doing, then I learn. I don't get mad. Look at him over there. Sitting there, you think you're doing all that stuff and ain't nobody scared of you. You ain't the new thing. I'm the, the pillar. Shut up. Just please spare me. Jesus, why don't you just sit down somewhere, grab you a cup of coffee, and learn. Humble yourself. If you don't humble yourself, you're going to die in the wilderness with your church and with your debt and with your 62-year-old youth pastor and your depressed wife and your carnal musician. You're going to just die. You're just going to die. You're just going to die there. You have no future to look forward to because you will not learn what you need to learn. Learn. Just humble yourself. And it'll be all over. In the morning. We got some great stuff going on in my city, man. But I'm going to tell you what we do need to pray. And look, at this intercessors conference this week, this is probably one of the things I'm going to pray about is mergers. Lord, let mergers come. Please, Jesus. Would you visit Halstead and Racine and Chicago Avenue? Visit State Street, Lord, and everybody that was not called to do what they were doing. Raise up the one with the most grace. Put Aaron and Miriam beside them, and please, is listen, we're just wasting money. <laughs> we wasting money, guys. Like, you paying, like, you paying, I mean, lights, rent. You, let's be financially responsible, especially if you people going to vote for Donald Trump. This is not the hour to be in an assignment that's not yours, guys. Let's merge. <laughs> now look, I know you think this is comical. I get it. I understand. But I'm really more serious than not. This is a big issue. Be like John. Hey, yo, I must decrease. Listen, here is my vow to the All Nations Worship Assembly of Chicago. When I'm done, I'm done. You are not going to have to plow a baton out of my hand. No. I honestly, if it's, if it's up to me, I'm not going past my 50th birthday. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. There's a 
big world out there with a lot to do, spheres of society to touch, things to speak into. I don't know if I'm going to run for office or if I'm going to be an advisor or if I'm going to be a political analyst on CNN or if I'm, if I'm going to go hang out with Michael Eric Dyson or Mark Lamont Hill. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm not slick. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to retire and I'm going to submit to the new pastor. I'm going to write books, plant churches, and prophesy. That's what I'm going to do. But I will not be the senior pastor of this church past 50. Half a century. No, 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 no. 40 is a whole generation. So uh, for me, when you start hitting, you know, and you don't have a plan, somebody needs to be direct enough in your tail asking you, what are you going to do? What is your plan? I, my wife will tell you, she is upstairs right now. I think today, I think today, every day about what I'm going to do post 50. I build today. I'm worried to listen. My church is only 12. I've got a lot of ways to go, but I'm I think today about who I would leave my church to. Who's going to lead it? Who's going to be there? Where I'm going to do? What am I going to be? But I won't be no, I'm not going to be in no wheelchair. Uh <laughs> talking about here's the world changes summit. No sir, won't be me. I much I much rather sit with leaders. I would rather go to nations. I want to be in the United Nations. I don't want to be there at world. I mean, and if I am at World Changes Summit, I mean, maybe I'll do conferences and write, but I'll oversee for the rest of my life and I'll prophesy for the rest of my life and I'll raise leaders for the rest of my life, but I will not be the pastor for the rest of my life. Sorry, guys. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be messing with my grandkids. No, it's just too much. It's a big world, a big world. And I've got a lot to do, you know? So this is a hard word for those that don't have vision for their lives because what they did was they came up with a project and made it vision. So they said, let me start a church. That's a project and that'll give me vision. And then it ended up confusing them for what God really called them to do. So they came up with a project because they don't know purpose. But if you're in your purpose, you're not going to give your life to a project. Go be an assistant pastor, youth pastor, associate pastor. Sit down somewhere. Find your original design and do what God called you to do. So at the end of the day, somebody asked how old I am. Now, you know, dang on, you don't ask black people how old they are. I'm not telling you how old I am. I mean, and especially because this is a crisis year. This birthday is a, is a birthday of crisis. I'm going through right now. I am in real menopause. I'm not, uh-uh. <laughs> I am 21, and that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> this is a crisis year for me, so I ain't telling you. But what I will say, <laughs> thank you, Lady Jules, 21. 21. My wife married me. Baby, when you marry me, my wife married me when I was 12. It was an arranged marriage from the island of Addis Ababa. Our, our, our ancestors. <laughs> it was an arranged marriage. And uh, our ancestors married us or from the island of Addis Ababa. Somebody said, I look 25. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Anyway, so this is this periscope. I hope that you pull some wisdom from it, although I was laughing and, and cutting up. But uh, get some vision. And um, yeah, and know what to do with your life. Hey, B. Miguel, don't start no church. Ricky Watson, I got to watch you a little while to figure out if you're supposed to start a church. Please. Pam Ross, don't start a church. Don't do it. Please. Pam Ross, I will pay you to not start a church. Don't do it. Yeah, Isaac, please. get. I can't keep you. Go and do there. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Please don't do it. 
B. McGill said, you ain't got to tell me twice. <laughs> no, just pray. Come on. Yeah, I'm going to watch. I don't know. <sighs> yes, Morris Plant Mini. I think you got about eight in you. You got about eight churches to plant. Jasmine, don't start a church. Please don't start one. Somebody say start for a... <laughs> Lord, please don't do it. Please stop. Don't do it. Baby, my wife is watching. Camila, don't you start no church. Uh-uh. Who's it, LJ? In Jesus' name. No, I'm not going to leave. I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to leave. <laughs> yes. Community citizen. That's what I'm talking about. Do that. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Can Jen start one? No, you tell Jen she is not to start. A t she can do some counseling teams and stuff, but please don't make Jen start no church. No, 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 no. Now later on, I may have to do a uh, a um, a periscope on the difference between somebody who is a founder and somebody who can take over something that was founded, who's got the grace to handle it but not do it. So. Let me get up off of here, guys. I'm done. Somebody said, what's a good book for pastors? Anything by Frank DiMazio. Frank DiMazio. Frank DiMazio is my favorite author on church leadership, hands down. Anything by Frank DiMazio concerning the local church is going to be powerful. He's got several of them, and it's going to be good, okay? Anything by Frank DiMazio. Now, on the other hand, I think that this is going to be a year where tremendous churches are born. And I'm just trying to convince those of you that are specialists not to do it. All right. Well, I love you guys. I know you're mad, boy, but I'm sorry. You'll be okay. Please, Emery Diggs, Negro's been calling me pastor for years. You might be. Just don't start a church. Just don't start a church. Emery, you got some scribe things going on in your life, though. Let me get off of here before I, I now I'm starting to prophesy. I'm pulling out of here. All right. The Lord bless all of you. Keep you. And then cause us for, hey, if you don't have anything to do this Thursday through Saturday, come and be with me um, at the Intercessors Conference in Chicago, Illinois at 6028 South Champlain. And uh, come and do it, okay? Uh, 60... 28 South Champlain and come and be with me this week for the Intercessors Conference and we're going to be praying about kingdom mergers, okay? <laughs> God bless you. Talk to you soon. Oh, now this thing don't want to let me go.